So many good people in our industry are doing it so incredibly hard that you know there aren't there aren't yeah there aren't a lot of solutions right now because we don't know where this is going. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Things are never as bad as they seem. It's something a close friend often says to me whenever the chips seem stacked against me. The emotional uncertainty that entwines us all right now with this pandemic suggests otherwise, but stories of hope, of human spirit are creeping back into our lives. The final toll it takes on the food sector is hard to ascertain, but we know it will be significant. And our regional restaurants that provide a platform for local producers and rely on the custom of travellers are dwindling, but they're not giving up. Annie Smithers is an award-winning chef and owner of Du Fermier, which translates as From the Farm. It's located in Trentham, Victoria. And Annie, um, how are you going? Well, it's pretty weird, isn't it? It certainly is. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's, pretty, it's pretty strange to um, – I have to say it's pretty strange not to be so tired all the time. Right. So you're, you're not working as much um, as a result because there's no people to feed. Well, I'm not, working, I'm not working at all in the restaurant because there's no people to feed. So something that I've done day in, day out for nigh on you know, 36 years has uh, been taken away from me in the most extraordinary circumstances. Can, can you tell us sort of how it unfolded for you? Because you know, being in a regional uh, environment, you know, your experience would be vastly different to the city or, or, or perhaps not. Can you tell us sort of when things started to change and you noticed? Oh, uh, look, I've, I've had my eye on it for quite a while. We are, um, you know, I feel that we're an incredibly lucky little restaurant in the fact that we are fully booked for each service that we open, um, the four little lunch services that we do. But... Um, you know, probably about six weeks ago, I started flagging it with the staff that this could be, you know, this is coming. And, you know, you know, then the next week the stock market started to soften. And generally, you know, when that happens, we know that some of our customers fall away because a lot of their income is tied up with the, how the stock market is performing. And then the week, the week that, you know, the week that we were going, you know, going to, you know, go about our normal business and it just got called that uh, we can't do it. So we just rang everybody in the book for the next four weeks and we'll see how long it takes. Yeah, and I guess you're reliant on, you know, people's ability to travel, which, you know, almost rules out takeaway, I guess, in a, in a way for you. I mean, what, what, what have you done so far with the restaurant to try and sort of adapt to the situation? And how's it affected your staff? We just closed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just closed and nobody's got any work. So it's pretty it's pretty brutal. I think the one of the things about my shop is that we really we're very small. So we 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 I have brought the business model down to something that is the most sustainable for my existence because I also grow a lot of the food that we use in the restaurant. Well, let's have a look at that. Can you paint a picture of you know what what that what that entails? Uh, what that entails is working about two acres of land to grow fruit and veggies for the restaurant. The restaurant operates on a fixed menu type setup, so we have you know a, a, we actually have a great model where there's no wastage. We're we're full. Um, we don't waste man hours. We don't waste food because it's a set menu. Um, and you have a very different connection to it when you actually grow it. Uh, wastage is something that is, uh, you know, something that you take very seriously because you've watched these things grow from seeds or seedlings. And how has it impacted on your staff? Like you said, you had to let not all of them go, but they're all living in the same area as well. And what have, what have you done to manage that situation? Well, they're all they're all living locally. Um, you know, I, I did a, a risk assessment on who 
who needed specific help before we closed it all down in case there was anything that was worthwhile manufacturing to, you know, make income for them. Um, and we all decided as a team we'd, we'd sit it out um, and, you know, work on the premise that the best case scenario is that we have a strong business to come back to as opposed to bleed what little resources there are at the beginning and then, you know, maybe, you know, jeopardise what we, what we have to come back to. Um, the only thing that I can really do is, you know, the thing, about, the thing about food and the thing about growing food or making food or being a supplier, whether it's a supplier to your own restaurant or not, is the food keeps growing. I've got plants in that are, you know, basically for the next six months, um, you know, food growing that is to see me all the way through winter. So, you know, each week I go into work, into my little quiet, quiet world and <laughs> I start up the Hobart and I bake a bit of bread and I make a few cakes and I do a bit of biscuits and we put together a, a veggie a, mi- a veggie plus box, which is I've kept my milk order going so that, um, you know, I get my you know, lovely organic milk in each, each week and it means that, you know, I, I can do something, which is provide them with fresh food um, and one less trip to anywhere that could be, you know, putting them in danger of getting sick. So you're supplying your staff with a, a food box every week? A little food box, yeah, yeah. That's 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 well. If you, they've lost their jobs, but that's kind of a nice little thing to keep them going, I guess, in the pretty uncertain times. Well, initially, initially, one of the things that we did look at was doing veggie boxes, you know, to say, you know, to sell to the general public, and it it really it it really sort of blew my brain out a bit. Sort of, yeah, you know, what what I usually used to. Yeah, you know, take into the restaurant, put on the entree, put on the main course, using the dessert. When you actually start splitting it up across fifteen veggie boxes, it doesn't go very far. So, you know, families families eat a whole lot of food. Well, that's true, and I think a, a a lot of people are eating a lot of food right now because they can't get outside. So, I think um, definitely people are going to be putting on weight if anything. Well, they they are eating a lot of food, but I think one of the really yeah, you know, it, it it's hard to say one of the lovely things to come out of this because you know it is a dire dire worldwide situation. But I you know, I think people will be cooking at home and just spending more time on it. You know the the whole feeling of cooking at home is very different. There's a lot of families out there that have the chef parent or the chef person suddenly at home at all hours of the day cooking breakfast, cooking lunch, cooking dinner because that's what they do. And, you know, we're probably making our families eat a little bit too much. Yes. Now you've got um, your foot in sort of both camps in the sense that you are a chef and a restaurateur, but you're also growing the produce. And I know you're very um, passionate about producers and suppliers and they've been, they're sort of like, but they're not as in the limelight as chefs, and but they've been hit pretty hard too. But I know talking to you the other day, um, you were saying one of your suppliers has cut down to three days. And do you want to tell us a bit about what's happening with suppliers as well? Yeah, there's you know a bit like the vegetables. It's uh, yeah, th- stock doesn't stop growing. You know whether it's whether it's lamb, whether it's goat, whether it's beef, whether it's vegetables, fruit, all of this stuff you know needs picking, needs needs selling. Or you know, on the meat side, needs slaughtering. You know, the the duck industry. You know, Great Ocean Road ducks. They they do their ducks in about fourteen weeks. They'll have fourteen weeks of ducklings coming along. Uh, but the other thing that I'm most concerned about is that it has been a very different and brutal uh, holiday season. Uh, with you know, I know you covered this a lot with Jackie, but you know, with the bushfires leading into, you know, it, the floods leading into coronavirus is we've actually had four months where our normal, you know, that part of that boom trade cycle of our industry has been missing in action. And one of the things I, I worry personally most about is that there's suppliers out there that will have, you know, possibly two or three months' worth of invoices on their desks that will never be paid. Now, what happens? What, what, 
you know, what happens to those people who have put just as much on the line as a restaurateur has um, to provide our industry with, you know, extraordinary goods, what happens to them when none of those bills get paid? And it's just, it just makes, it makes you weep. It's just so many good people in our industry are doing it so incredibly hard that, you know, there aren't, there aren't, yeah, there aren't a lot of solutions right now because we don't know where this is going. What, why did you get into hospitality and chefing originally? And can you remember sort of that experience of first manning the tools and getting in a kitchen? I think, um, I think initially as a kid I wanted to be a butcher. I had this sort of bizarre love of cutting up the mat, the cat meat, and yeah, you know, hearing the so- the sound of the blade <laughs> cut through flesh, which sort of you know perhaps I should have been a butcher or a serial killer. I don't know, but um, <laughs> it's pretty you know. Um, but sort of through school, you know, as an adolescent, I you know as a kid and an adolescent, I cooked a lot, and eventually, you know, I finished school. But those last two years, I decided that I wanted to be a cook. My parents, you know, ate out a lot and sort of took us took us round and about to restaurants and very nice restaurants at times. And the it just appealed to me. And I can never quite pinpoint why, but when I left school I went about going about and finding myself an apprenticeship at 17. And you know, I think I love it every day more than I loved it yesterday, and that's been a continuing theme. What are you? What are you gonna? What are you missing most at the moment in regards to the restaurant and um, the fact that you know you're going into an empty site at the moment and and pushing on? But what are, what are you missing most? I'm missing. I'm missing. Uh, I'm missing hanging out with the crew. You know, I think yeah. You know, it would be fair to say that most restaurants you sort of you become. They become your chosen family. You've got your family at home, but the the people you work with are family as well. Um, and also the interaction with the customers. It, um, you know, there is, you know, there's that beautiful joy of what we provide for people. This is what we do. We we have them for two, three hours of their life, and it's our job to nourish them and nurture them and love them. And it's that sense that I'm really missing. Initially, I thought I just was just missing my ego being stroked, but I think it's a little bit. <laughs> I think it, I think it's a little bit more wholesome than that. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. That is good to hear. Um, so, what's I know that we're sort of at the whim of um, the regulations at the moment and the decisions made by the government, and also getting the curve down of the with this pandemic that's on at the moment, but. Um, What's 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 your plan in the next period of time? Well, I I spend a lot of time in the veggie garden. Um, you know, I'm you know I'm very hands on the tools out there now, which is actually delightful. Um, doing a bit of writing, you know, doing a bit of thinking. Um, I think that one of the things that it has given everyone in hospitality uh, when you separate yourself from that, it, it feels a little like a parallel universe. And when you separate, I, I have a regime where every morning I, you know, contact a couple of institutions. I only do two a day. That's my limit. And, you know, whether it be the tax office or whether it be, you know, my personal banking or any of those things. So I do that first thing in the morning and then I get on with my day. But one of, we will, when we're allowed to, we'll reopen and see what happens. Um, as I said earlier, you know, I have a very small business that can be scaled for the for the need that it, you know comes at us. But I'm really hoping that this time, because hospitality people never have any time, we're always we're always pushing it uphill, aren't we? Yeah, you know, we're always running around, you know, chasing chasing yeah. the next docket or putting your orders in or you know trying. It's just it's just a really high octane life. So to suddenly have all this thinking time could could have some really good results at the end of it for a lot of people. And 
the industry as a whole has really been mired in the last you know couple of years by you know the the exercise with the award being difficult, the payment scandals, all of those things, and perhaps this is a time where we can you know each of us can give it a great deal of thought in terms of. What does the brave new world look like on the other side? Can we construct an industry that is for the new world instead of trying to adapt the old world of hospitality to this new age that's come upon us of sort of remembering that people have families, remembering that people have lives, remembering that they have other commitments, paying a fair day's wage for a fair day's work and how to structure our businesses so that we Look at that at, yeah, you know, with a, when we start again, we look at all of those things with a really clean sheet and say, okay, we're starting from nothing. It's going to be hard, but how do we construct an industry that is fairer and better than the one that we've been forced to leave behind? What would you like to see? What, you know, if you could, um, be the mastermind behind the new dawn of Australian <laughs> hospitality. What, what sort of restaurants would you like to see emerge? What sort of environments for people to share food in? Well, I think that one of the most, I think one of the things that I'm most passionate about is uh, the mental health of our industry, having suffered terrible mental health, you know, um, across my career. Um, and I think that we need to look the, the first thing I think that we need to look at is looking at working hours and say, okay, how can we, how can we run restaurants across, whether they be multiple services or single services, where people generally work a standard seven and a half, eight hour day and how to make that a viable option for business owners, uh, so that the staff is, the staff is valued and they're, right to a life and an existence outside of hospitality is also. And I, I feel it would give us a much better uh, productivity. I think it would give us a, a much more, I don't know, is human, humane approach to it. I've, I mean, I've done, I've done the long hard hours and I've been awfully proud of the fact that, you know, I've done how many triple shifts in a row and things, but it doesn't, I I cut my restaurant back to what I thought was sustainable because at some point I realised that I couldn't be everything for everybody all of the time and I made a decision that I would run the shop in a way that it was just enough to, you know, make a life for me but not be so much that I felt, you know, overwhelmed by it all the time. So... It's sort of it's a model that's personally mine. I'm not a an empire builder by any means. <laughs> yeah, but, sorry, to, sorry to throw that on you. <laughs> yeah. But but it's sort of you know I I I love I love the small model. But do you think that's something that we're going to see a lot of? Do you think we're going to see a lot of the small um, smaller operators and sort of you know more unique um, sort of homely offerings um, that are more um, particular to certain areas of Australia and communities? Possibly. I mean, I, I mean, on a historical level, if I look back at, say, the last you know, 10, 15 years, is I was very fearful of the small, the, the future of the, the small model as the, the big groups started to move in. And I thought, look, we're never going to survive. We're never going to have the buying power. We're never going to have the... Yeah, you know, the ability to keep up with these, you know, these big groups that can afford, you know, big fit outs, you know, big media campaigns, all of those things. But it seems like the balance has actually settled a bit. And there is there is a different mentality in an owner operated business yeah, definitely. than one that is across many, many things. So it's sort of it will be – I think the market will dictate what is needed. People people are incredibly cooped up. How long they're going to be cooped up for, we don't know. But they're suddenly rediscovering cooking at home 
they're rediscovering whether they can or they can't cook. <laughs> uh, <Yeah>. they're, <laughs> they're also they're also cooking on rations. So it is a. I suspect that when when the curtain is lifted and we're allowed out again and allowed to operate, is that there won't be you know there won't be an enormous amount of discretionary spending available to the market as a whole. But I feel that hospitality is going to have a little honeymoon period because, A, there's going to be people out there that are never going to want to eat their mother's spaghetti bolognese <laughs> ever again. Yeah. Um, but also that, the, <laughs> that conviviality of actually sitting down and sharing a meal with friends. Um, and we're go- it's going to be it's going to be so incredibly special when when we're all allowed to do that again because it is part yeah we're a herd animal we're part of this is part of who we are and what we are and that sense of a not making any dishes because i think one of the shortages that will happen soon is dishwasher tablets um (laughs) b (laughs) b um you know sitting down for dinner with the same people every single you know day um so I think that the hospitality has the option, you know, has the capacity to, when we come out of this, is actually really be there for, you know, everybody that says, "Oh my God, I can go out and see my yeah. friends." Yeah. You know, so I think we're all missing that. There is, you know, when we get when when we see the light at the end, you know, when when there is a light, because at the moment we're just in a tunnel. Yeah. Um. You know, it will be hopefully a very bright light. And in the meantime, you know, we keep doing what each of us do. I mean, it's amazing seeing a lot of the city restaurants mobilise themselves to cook for the medics, to cook for the carers. Um, And it's an industry that just, it just keeps giving. Whether, you know, we're on our knees in terms of, you know, we've just been closed, yet we still have the personalities to do extraordinarily uh, generous, beautiful, caring, loving, supporting, nurturing things, which really wraps up who we are and what we are as an industry. I couldn't agree with that anymore. Annie, you've been amazing. Um, please keep in contact and let us know how you go through the year. But um but really appreciate your time and um, hopefully talk to you soon. Thank you so much. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospo community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. A special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Stay safe, isolate and be well.